you are the living water. All that our soul needs to be satisfied. Will we not settle for anything less? Holy Spirit, would you move in this place? Would you be over these moments as we come to your word, as we seek your truth, as we know we have a God who fights for us, who has given us a spirit that empowers us from the inside out. Lord, would we be your people? Would you be over these moments we share? And everybody said, a foundation. And it's a series called Ecos. It is a, it is a Greek word. And yes, I am the culprit uh, that decided we should name it this. Um, because uh, ecodomeo literally means to build up. Ecos means a house, a building, or a dwelling place. And ecodomeo uh, doesn't roll off the tongue as nicely. So I decided Ecos worked better. Um, because the whole point of the series is a look at how amazingly God will fill believers with the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit will dwell within us, fill us, and empower us to do all that God is calling us to do. But they all point to this truth, that spiritual gifts are for the building up of the church. And the church in Scripture is spoken about as the house. We're not talking about a house or a building that is made of brick and mortar. The church is people. And so it's no shock that God desires to dwell in people, empower them by the power of the Spirit. And one of those incredible ways He does it is through the Spirit. That's what this series is all about. Uh, Last week when James kind of set all the foundations for us, um, we are now going to get very specific. We're going to actually look at two specific gifts that are given uh, and evidenced in Scripture. And they're the two miraculous or sign gifts, healing and miracles, and everyone got excited. Um, We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 12 again, and so I'm going to read a bunch of it um, that we had seen last week just to give us some context, but also just to help remind us and refresh us uh, if we weren't here. It starts in 1 Corinthians 12 in verse 1. You can follow along with me. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. This is the heart of this series. Because we want to hold the balance of understanding that God's word has something to say to us. That we can walk this tightrope of walking out the spirit as he would have us. But we don't want to be uninformed. We want to walk and stand on God's truth. Verse 4 says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. And then verse 8 says, For to one is given through the Spirit, and it goes on this whole list in 1 Corinthians 12 of all the spiritual gifts that we have listed here. There are some in other places as we saw last week, but specifically this list. The two that we are looking at today are at the end of verse 9 and 10. It says, To another, the gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another, the working of miracles. And it all ends off in verse 11 where it says, All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one He individually, individually as He wills. It's going to be a bit of a different preach. Um, so I said, you need the seatbelt last week uh, for the rebuke announcement. Now it's a different type of seatbelt because it's going to feel different. The first half of this preach, we're going to look at setting some groundwork, understanding these sign and miraculous gifts. And then the second half, we're going to get specific into the actual gifts themselves. Is that good? I want to set some groundwork, remind you of some stuff that came out of last week, uh, because it's so foundational to where we go. When we come to something like spiritual gifts, and specifically the sign or miraculous miracles, we should start where Paul starts, because he starts with God. That actually we should understand there is a start, and it's a good place to start, because there is a source for these spiritual gifts. That there's a supernatural God who empowers these gifts in us. And so we start there. That's where he starts. And we can sometimes fall for the trap of either being overly obsessed with the Spirit or neglecting of the Spirit. I want you to see that even in this passage that lays out the spiritual gifts, where it says the Holy Spirit gives gifts or portions as he wills, that the Trinity is here. That we can sing King of Kings, God three in one, it's here. That's why it says there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. Holy Spirit is there. It says there are a variety of service, but the same Lord. Jesus is Lord of Lord. The Son is there. It says there's a variety of activities, but it is the same God, God the Father, who empowers them all. This is a Trinitarian thing. This is empowered by the Godhead, but it specifically comes through God the Holy Spirit. 
Now, we amazingly also have the model of how to walk this out well in Jesus. Because Jesus would do his ministry on earth empowered by the Holy Spirit. So that now, we can do that ministry with the same Spirit. Why? Because we have the same Lord under the same God who is our authority. So his mission is our mission. His authority is our authority. And it means we fall in line. We walk in line in the same way. God gives these gifts to us as believers to empower us for all that he calls. Now, when we get to the miraculous or sign gifts, we'll see in scripture they're called signs, wonders, works, um, miraculous powers. And they're called sign gifts specifically because just like a sign or a signpost, they point to a destination or a place. And what they specifically point to is a truth, a reality of truth that Jesus is king. And if he is king, His kingdom is over the supernatural and natural. And we get a picture of kingdom power entering in to earthly spaces. And so we get to see these signs. We go wrong because we get caught up in the signs and forget the signs are there to point us back to Jesus. We need to hold that tension. Now, last week, James um, did uh, address that there'll be many of us who come from basically two sides of this within our approach and our attitude, and that might be based on the experience you've had. We're going to have those who are the super conservative. We're going to have those who are the super charismatic, and we're all in the same room. It's okay. You're going to have those who are deeply cautious. You're going to have those who are deeply desiring to see these things. But I want to say it again. Here at City, we're so aware that many of us have different backgrounds, experiences, church traditions that we kind of have come from that have molded and shaped us into one of these things. But we want to encourage you, whether you came from old denominational mainstream church, kind of the chosen frozen, don't worry, it's not you, it's the 8 a.m., you guys came later, (laughs) or the super charismaniac Pentecostals who like used to do flag waving and worship. Anyone there? We did some crazy things in church. And then there's the people who go, Dunks, I have no idea what you are talking about. Because there's no context. I don't, con- con- I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, you guys waved flags and what, yeah. We did these crazy things. And so we understand people come from different places and have different backgrounds, experiences. But what I want to implore again is this. That here at City, we seek to live in the balance and the tension of these things. That on the one side, we want to hold to God's word because this is his ultimate authority but on the other side we want to walk by the spirit because it's a gift given by him to do all that he has asked asked us to do i want you to know if we are only word and no spirit we will be dry and dead and we will miss out on the walk that jesus is calling but if we are only spirit and not word and we toss that to the side can i tell you we do crazy things We go off with the fairies, and we get very unbiblical. These gifts are given. You can clap. It's okay. If we're all going to clap, we're going to do it together. Clap. I have always said this. If you've not been here, I always say this. The more you respond, the better I preach, the better it is for everyone. (laughs) These gifts are given by the Spirit. But I I, I hope you know, these Spirit, they're they're called under... No, we'll get... uh, See, I'm getting ahead of myself. Whew. Beyond our attitudes, our experiences, our approaches, I think it is also so important just to highlight that there are different positions on this thing within church. That actually we need to be very clear as to what those positions are and where we as City Hope Church fall. And so I want to actually hone in on that. And so as elders and as City Hope Church, I want to be very clear where we sit. And the big two tribes, and I say tribes because we're all within the big C church, Jesus, Team Jesus, we're all on it. But the two big tribes that you can be on within, with specifically these gifts and the miraculous gifts is two big words, either cessationism or continuationism, right? Those are the two. And basically, it's all trying to ask this question, are certain gifts still available and operational and existing now through believers and in the church? That's the question that's on the table. I'll give you some definitions so we all know what we're talking about. Cessationism is this position, that the supernatural sign gifts existed and functioned only in the first century to confirm and approve the authority of the apostles. Their message, but these gifts have now ceased because of the canon of scripture is complete. 
If you want to know what cessationism, that's it. I'll give you a note here just so no one gets confused. Most cessationists don't say that the miraculous or healing has completely ceased and stopped. They just say that the gift of those things working through believers has now ceased. Most are on that. So I'll just give that caveat so that our cessationist friends believe I have represented them well. Continuists. Continuationists would believe this, that the supernatural sign gifts continue to operate until the kingdom is fully established at the second coming of Jesus. And so just to be clear, I don't think you've had to be here for long to know, um, but as elders and as City Hope Church, we fall into the continuous position. And so we believe that and want to affirm that all the gifts are in operation, should be desired, earnestly sought, and be functioning in believers and in the church. Um, and that's really important. But I want to give this caveat. According to the limits of Scripture. Right? All the cautious guys in the room? Don't worry. We're, we're here. And it's so important that we understand that. And we're going to talk about why we find ourselves in this position and not in the cessationist position. But I want to just be very clear that if the gifts are given as, to each believer, we hold this as our highest authority. And so there's no gift that trumps this. There's no gift that's equal to this. There's no new revelation. Actually, the gifts come under the authority of the Bible. And so we want to make sure that when we work in these things, we desire them, we operate in these things, we want to do it in a biblical way. So we're never going to violate something that's taught against in Scripture. We're never going to go against a command in how to do this and how to not do this. And so this is our final authority. It all comes under it. There's nothing equal to it, nothing above it. Be very, very clear. But the question is, why do we fall to the continuous side and not cessationist side? And I think it's important to give you a bit of the picture. Some of us might be shocked at, uh, I'm going to put up a little list for us, of cessationists through history, because maybe some of your favorite theologians, writers, pastors, preachers actually fall in that camp and were that or are that. And so I'll go to an early church father, Augustine, Augustine, if we've got any Americans in the house, Augustine, uh, he was for the most part of his life a cessationist. Believe that sat in that tribe. He did change his mind at the end of his life. You look through uh, a few theologians through history, uh, John Calvin, James's homeboy, we agree on so, uh, trust me, we agree on so much, we don't agree on this, and that's okay. Jonathan Edwards, Matthew Henry, John Owen, George Whitfield, B.B. Warfield, and then even into the modern day, theologians like uh, Norman Geisler, R.C. Sproul, and probably the most famous in the camp right now is John MacArthur. I know lots of people who listen to his preaching, love his books, maybe have, I, I've seen a few John MacArthur study Bibles, I've seen them around, don't worry. And this is why some people, the joke went over their head when James said, I've got a quote from John MacArthur about spiritual gifts, and it's hilarious that I do. This is why. But I want to, uh, you'll see there's also a, a little asterisk there by R.C. Sproul, because he would also change his position later in life. In 2019, he'd actually jump ship and move to the continuous side. But I, I want to set a little bit of groundwork here, because I think it's so important. You might be, your mind might be blowing up right now, because you're like, I don't understand. Now there's different sides, and it's a debate. I just want to be helpful. We are all on Team Jesus. And it's, the difference is this. We have got closed hand issues and we have open hand issues. In closed hand things, things that have to do with the gospel, with our beliefs that are entrenched in who God is and how he relates to us and how we can relate to him, these are things that are closed hand. This is where we are now going to say, actually, there might be a division here. Because we can't move forward because these things are so fundamental to the gospel and the good news of Jesus. However, there are many of things that are open hand. And so when we get to continuationism versus cessationism, we're in the open hand. Because understand, what a cessationist is saying is that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased and are not in operation right now. They're not denying the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer and our salvation. They're very clear the Spirit seals us. Quite literally, we are, have a heart of stone that's replaced with a heart of flesh. They're not denying any of this, the role of the Holy Spirit. We're only playing with the gifts. And so I just want to always draw that line, that we need to know where we are, that we can disagree, but we can love each other the same because we're on Team Jesus. They're not preaching a different Jesus. They're not preaching a different gospel. We're standing on the truth of God's Word, but we can have a disagreement here. 
That's why you can have R.C. Sproul changing his mind. You can have Augustine changing his mind because it's on these things. It's so important. The key text I want to take you to is in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, James had uh, referenced a, a section of this last week, but it really is the key text in understanding the different sides and how this all plays together. Starting in verse 8, it says this, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. James read this last week. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And so this text, which is teaching on spiritual gifts, is very clear that there will be a day when the spiritual gifts will cease because they will no longer be needed. The question is when. And this is where we might differ. And the key comes in the verse that says, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. And the interpretation of what that perfect comes means is the key. Because cessationists will uh, interpret the perfect as being the Bible, God's perfect word. And so the supernatural gifts were there in, act, in the first century to attest to the authority of the apostles so that they could write scripture for us that we know is godly, that has the seal of approval that this is God's word for us. And it's attested to by these gifts at work. But because now uh, the canon is finished and complete, we've got God's word exactly as it's wanted, it's perfect, it means now those gifts don't need to be in operation anymore. Now we are in full agreement, I think I've made my, my point, that God's word is perfect, that we believe that the Bible as it is, is God's word for us that it is perfect, that it should be our highest level of authority, that there is nothing equal to or greater than that in terms of authority. But where we find a, a difference in our interpretation is we don't believe the perfect comes is speaking about the canon or the completion of the canon of Scripture, but actually when the perfect comes is when the perfect kingdom comes at Jesus' second coming. And this is where the difference kicks in. That's why it says, even in this passage in verse 12 specifically, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. And that language is so important because that language is actually apocalyptic. In Revelation 22, at the second coming of Jesus, where his kingdom is established in eternity, a key ingredient at that time that doesn't come before that time is we will see Jesus face to to face. Nothing in the way, no veil, nothing, not as if seeing in a mirror, but we will see his face in its completeness. And it's so important that we see that because it's right here. I think cessationists are also forgetting what Paul had said at the beginning of this letter to the Corinthians in chapter 1. Because don't get me wrong, the Corinthian church was a messed up church. They had so much wrong, but they were also going off with the fairies in terms of the spiritual. And so even Paul is trying to pull them back to, hey, this is how we center this thing on truth. But he speaks in chapter 1 about his purpose for writing the letter. I want you to be sure in doctrine. I want you to know the gospel that I preach to you and stand on that. that, that is, I want you to see God's word as the ultimate authority. And in verse 7, he says, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul makes it clear the gifts are given and they should continue. So they run into a biblical problem, but cessationists also run into a historical problem. It actually says this, uh, uh, well, cessationists will always say this and, and, and hold to this quite strongly, that, when you, uh, that history has proven that uh, miracles and healing happening through believers actually did cease historically after the first generation, the apostolic age, after they had passed away. But they run into issues because from that time until now, because cessationism, I hope you see, is not a modern trend. It's always been with us. But from that time until now, they've always had the awkward moment of trying to explain away miraculous or healing moments where it very clearly involved a, uh, the gifting of a believer. 
And so they have to sometimes do some Olympics and gymnastics to get around that. I love, I, I, I was going to share this a bit later, but, and, and I'll come back to it. R.C. Sproul, when he uh, switched teams, became continuous. In 2019, I read the interview where he spoke about it. Um, he had said, for my entire life, I had always actually identified and, and, and articulated my position as a leaky cessationist, which I think is the most ironic thing ever. It's like the spirit is the, of God is there. It's not going to believe us. But every now and then, God just leaks a little something. He, and then, oh, oh, sorry, healed, miraculous. Like, it's, it's a hilarious thing. Um, but it's, it's something that I think cessationists actually have to look at. And one thing historically that they, I think they need to look at is a guy called Arrhenius. Um, Arrhenius was an early church father. There he is. And uh, he was born in about 120 AD. I'm going to do the maths for you. Uh, he writes basically 80 to 100 years after the last apostle, the apostle John, actually died. So we are well out. And he's born in 120. Most of his life he'd be the bishop of a place called Smyrna. But he had a, a heritage in Christian leadership that most people uh, can't even touch. He was a disciple of a guy called Polycarp. And Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. And so we're on a third generation Christian leader who is a mighty theologian and writer and historian within the early church. Most of, uh, of the authentication of the gospel authors is actually because we have writings of Arrhenius talking about it. And so in the midst of like literature in antiquity, Arrhenius is huge historically because he gives us surety that the New Testament that was written is the New Testament we have. And it's because we have those writings, which is nuts. It, it, no one else has this in terms of ancient literature. But he writes, and uh, as I said, about 80 to 100 years after the final apostle has died. Now generations have passed. But he specifically records that believers, empowered by the Spirit, and he's explicit in his language, were casting out demons, were praying for those who were sick and they were healed, were praying for those who had died and they rose from the dead. And so a cessationist will take Arrhenius on the fact that the Gospels have authentic authorship, but somehow they must forget this. It's important that they run not only into a biblical wall, but a historical wall, because we have seen these things continue. And we can't do the gymnastics of trying to call ourselves leaky. That's not helpful. We have to look at this. Um, the point that R.C. Sproul had where he said, I, I looked at these things and I just couldn't put, uh, I couldn't actually reconcile the position I was in as a leaky cessationist. And now I actually have switched. And it's interesting how, uh, how he now references his position. He calls himself a cautious continuist. And as we get set to now get into the actual gifts of healing and miracles, I think that's a really important thing to double click on. Because I think there are many of us who probably are finding themselves in that space. And it's because we understand when you get into the miraculous, it can get weird because we've seen it get weird. We have seen misuse and abuse, and we have seen people who are in desperate need or lack be exploited by someone claiming to have this gift and it's not out of a desire to see that person healed or the miraculous to break out but actually for personal gain and it's important that we say this outright that the abuse of these gifts is horrendous and we reject it fully because we want to we want to walk out what God has called us to do but for anyone in the cautious space maybe you've been hurt by this maybe you've seen it maybe you just freaked out by it I want to encourage you, you don't correct misuse or abuse with no use. You fix it by right use. And so that means we might have got freaked out or even hurt by these things, but I want to encourage you, our reaction should not be, well, we reject these things, now let's run away from them. When there are gifts that have been given by Jesus, and he even gives us commands into how to use them, we actually walk it out with right use because he's given us the truth so that we can hold these things in tension to rightly walk it out. It's not corrected by no use. It's corrected by right use. And that's what we really want to do. So we'll look at the first one, the gift of miracles. We're defining this gift like this. It's the supernatural ability to call on the supernatural acts of God with no possible natural explanation, revealing his kingdom power here on earth. I think we can all agree 
that Jesus had a miraculous ministry. There was 40 miracles recorded through the Gospels. Uh, we're in the Gospel of Mark preaching this year, and a third of Mark's verses record miracles. That's how important it was to him. But miracles are so important because not of what they are in themselves. They're important because of what they point to. They're the signpost. It's to the truth of who Jesus is, his identity, and to the power he holds, his authority. That's why Peter, when he's preaching at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and the moment that the church would be gifted the Holy Spirit and we see the gifts explode, he will preach this at the end of verse 22. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. The mighty works, wonders, and signs are used by God to point to, to attest to the identity and the authority of Jesus. That's what it was for Jesus. That's what it should be for us. It is always a signpost to the truth of who Jesus is. And that's why when we see his miracles, where he has miracles that are over the demonic. So he has supernatural power of good over evil, light over dark. We see demons cast out. We see examples where it's over nature, where he'll feed the 5,000, 20,000 people with a lunchbox, or he'll walk on water, just defy all of it. It's where the supernatural overrides the natural, where he'll have power over death, raising his friend Lazarus, but even power over death in himself, just like Easter, as we celebrated a couple of weeks ago. And I want, I want to take you to John chapter 20. This is what he writes in, in verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. So we have a record of miracles because they're there to attest to, to point to who he is. This is the greatest hit. So this was selected for that purpose. But please also know there are books that could be written, libraries that could be filled of all the stuff that Jesus had done. But it's so important that we don't miss the purpose of the working of the miraculous, that we hold it in tension. There were others in Scripture who had this gift, and we see it play out. Even in the Old Testament, you have Moses and Elijah. Um, I, I would just thought about this when we were doing the baby dedication for Elia. You had the moment where uh, the prophets of Baal are on one side, Elijah is on one side, and they say, right, the God who is true can call down fire from heaven and light the altar. After having, like, Elijah literally gets it all baptized with a million liters of water and, says, and starts to make jokes, because the Baal guys, they can't do it. And he calls down fire from heaven, and God comes. Miraculous. Fire, whole altar gone. All the prophets of Baal actually are put to death. But in that moment, the people uh, uh, understand that God is legit and God is real. And it's interesting because God had given Elijah the name Elijah. And I think it's because he knew what was happening in this moment. Because as the people took Elijah and lifted him up, because he was the victor over the evil prophets of Baal, they all are shouting, Elijah, Elijah, Elijah. But what does Elijah mean? Yahweh is God. Because again, the miracle is not, hey, let's celebrate and give glory to Elijah. The signpost is Yahweh is God. That's how the miraculous works. He did, um, the, we saw miracles come through the apostles. It says many wonders and signs were done through them at the end of Acts chapter 2. Stephen, who wasn't an apostle, this is an awkward one for our cessationist friends. Stephen, who was not an apostle, in Acts chapter 6, it says through him many great miracles were done. Paul is a great example. We see miracles coming through him in his time in Ephesus in Acts 19. We see him cast out demons in Acts 16. And so the work of the miraculous has always been at play, but we have a model in Jesus that we can follow. Now there's some common misuses or errors that I really wanna highlight in the midst of this gift. I think the first misuse of this gift is exactly this. Those with the gift who exalt themselves and not God. Those who would seek the cries of the crowd that say, hey, give me praise, and not point to the truth of God himself, that he is powerful. It's supposed to be a sign boast. It is never about the one with the gift. It is about the one who does the work. God is the one who moves in the miraculous. Second one is this, those with the gift who believe themselves in their gift to be superior to other Christians or other Christian leaders. 
We saw this last week. There's no hierarchy in the gifting. It is all given by God for the common good to build up the church. And so there's no one gift that beats another. And therefore, it means the one who has been given a gift cannot be better than another. All different body parts doing in the same thing. There's no superiority. And the last one is, is really a warning because we know we can do this. An error we can fall into is when we chase the spectacular, not the Savior. There were many who saw the miracles of Jesus, witnessed them, couldn't deny, and did not follow, did not turn. Because this was true in the first century, and it is true today. There are many who seek the show and not the Savior. There are many who want to see the supernatural, but not Jesus. There are many who want to be entertained, but will reject the truth. See, the application for us is that we should never be a people that seek the signs, but seek the Savior. That we should only ever be a people who seek Jesus first. Because can I tell you, we, we go wrong. If we chase miracles and wonders and signs, we'll miss Jesus. But amazingly, if we chase Jesus, signs, miracles, and wonders will follow him. And so we have to get the order right. We have to get our direction right. We have to get our focus right. We don't chase the miracle. We don't chase the sign. We go after the one that the sign points to. And amazingly, what happens? More miracles and signs come along the way. And that's how we hold these things in tension. We earnestly desire, but we don't get caught up in. We turn to the... You can clap on that one. It's okay. I think it's so important that we... We hold these things in tension. That's really what God's wanting to, us to do as we come to his word. Second gift we're going to look at is the gift of healing. So this is the supernatural ability to call on God in prayer. Seeing those who are uh, sick healed. Restoring the natural through the supernatural power of God. Revealing his kingdom and, all, and all the, where all sickness will be healed in eternity. I think this is the real moment where those who are cautious have right to be cautious. I think we've all seen the script play out. We've seen the video. We, we've, we've got the heads up. We know the guys who walk out in white suits with a Rolex on the wrist, shouting at a TV, if you pay X amount, your prayer can get answered tonight and you can be healed. I think we've seen this. I think we know it. And, and we need to look it in the face. I remember there was a few years ago, I'm not going to named the pastor, but he had a big event happening at F&B Stadium. And it was the moment where there was so much good, and then I, I, I witnessed the moment where it went astray. And it was uh, at the start of the first offering. There was like 12 that night, but there was, it was the first one. The first offering of the night. And the guy got up, and it's a night of preaching and ministry and worship and healing. We should desire these things. But in sharing and, 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 and teeing up this first offering, he, he says, hey, I want to I take you to a moment in Scripture. I want to take you to a moment in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 8. And I thought, okay, we're, we're starting in a good place. We're going to Scripture. And he takes it to the moment where there's the woman with the issue of blood. And the crowd is all pressing in on Jesus. And she just believes. I have faith for if I, I can just get to Jesus, I'd be healed. She had, it says, Luke Luke records it all. He said she, for 12 years she had suffered. No physician could ever heal her. She had done everything humanly possible in the natural and was at her end. And seeking Jesus, she, all she could do in the midst of the crowd was just touch the hem of his garment. And in that moment, in that instant, he was healed. She was healed. Got it right. She was healed. And this is the sentence where I knew, cool. We went stage left and we got this thing wrong. Because this guy stood up and he said, God's heart is that he would heal. God's heart is that he would restore. Good. He says, this lady had faith that if, 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 if she could just get to Jesus, if she could just touch Jesus, she'd be healed. Don't you want Pastor What What to touch you tonight? And that's where I was like, ooh, it's a small thing, but it's a big thing. It wasn't, hey, Jesus who has the power, who is the great physician, who is our healer, who can empower a believer with a gift that is not meant to be the be-all and end-all, but merely a signpost to the truth of it, can now pray for you and touch and you will be healed. It's, no, 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 Pastor, what, what is Jesus? And if you touch him, you'll get healed. 
It's a small sentence, but it's profound in how it plays out. Because this is never what it's meant to be. It is God using the natural, us, to bring supernatural power so that there can be restoration and healing. That's what it was always meant to be. And so I want to, again, remind us, abuse or misuse is not corrected by no use. It's corrected by right use. And so let's come back to what, what is the purpose of healing? Because I think we have a big disconnect when we, what we believe healing should and could be versus what God actually wants it to be. We think it's simply physical healing. Actually, God's in a much bigger equation thinking of eternity because he's not just about physical healing. He does do that, but he's about complete restoration because he cares not just about your body. He cares about your body, your mind, and your soul. So I have moments of like Mark chapter 2 with the paralytic. We saw it earlier as we were preaching through. God is paralyzed. Jesus' first words, your sins are forgiven. Why? I care about your greatest need, that you are in need of salvation. But I, that doesn't mean I'm not going to restore your legs. I get to do that. I'm God. I get to choose. But understand the healing that comes from the supernatural, it takes out the whole person. I think sometimes we think that... Uh, in the midst of the gift of healing, there is always going to be a war or a battle between medicine and science and God and the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, we have recorded in Gospels and Acts, in, in vast detail, accounts of the miraculous work, accounts of recorded healings that are very specifically um, recorded away so, so that we know that it is verified that the supernatural took over the natural. You have 27 individuals in the Gospels that get healed by Jesus, 10 groups of people that get healed by, G by Jesus. Great detail. The uh, book of Acts was written by Dr. Luke. He's a physician, New Testament and historian. But we think that there has to be a war between medicine and science and God and the Holy Spirit. If the book was written by a doctor who is recording in such detail so that we can verify this was supernatural, not natural. These things aren't actually at war with, with each other. He gives us this detail because he wants us to know at a natural level this thing couldn't happen. So much so that we have had medical scientists in the modern age look back at the accounts that Luke gives us. Twelve of the 28 chapters of the book of Acts record healings, where they go back to look and in such detail, he has done it as a physician so that we know we have reached the end of the natural and now something supernatural has kicked in. There were those who said, oh, Jesus didn't really die because it was the key of, it's a closed hand issue. He has to die so that he can rise again. That makes sense. There was those who said, we don't know if he really died. They faked it. Medical science looks at the report of Luke, a doctor, and they say there is no way by what is here and the natural he died. It's so important that we hold these two things in tension and we don't think they're fighting each other. But we need to understand the purpose of healing from God's perspective. It is not just about the physical. It is about the entire person. I think this is our issue. I'm going to put up this graphic. Mind, body, and soul. Natural intervention only ever goes after the mind and body. That's where we seek as humans to intervene. It is only when you get to supernatural healing that the soul gets cared for too. It's why, son, your sins are forgiven matters, and then I'll heal your legs. Because God knows in the, his sovereignty across all of eternity and over all of history, that what is the use of me temporarily healing your legs right now, and you die for eternity broken apart from God forever? There's no point. So he says, I'm not just going to care about your mind and your body, I'm going to care about your soul. And when we have moments where we struggle because we go, God, I am so struggling in my body. I need healing. Or God, I am so struggling in my mind, my mental and emotional health right now. And why are you not healing me? I think what we need to know is that there is no power in the person with the gift, that there is only power in God. But the God we have hope, faith, and trust in is the God who knows it all and knows what is best. And so whether we get healed now in the temporary or healed ultimately in eternity, the beautiful truth is that healing is guaranteed. And I know that's difficult when we've lost someone to cancer and we prayed so hard. I know it's so hard when we're in the midst of the suffering going, God, why are you let me through this? 
Can I tell you? God uses it all. But the hope we have in eternity is that everything gets healed. When Jesus in, in Revelation says, I will wipe away every tear, there will now be no sickness, no disease. It's why the gifts need to stop now, because we don't need them anymore. There will be a day where the gift of healing is not needed anymore. Because this is the thing. God's heart hasn't changed. Human needs haven't changed. In that day, it will change. We will no longer need it. But we can trust in the God who looks at a restoration of our entire being. And we can trust Him with it. Some common uh, errors in this gift that I really want to highlight is there are those who wrongly believe every prayer by someone with this gift results in healing. Speak to anyone who has this gift and walks it out humbly, rightly, according to Scripture, and they will tell you their hit rate is not 100%. There was only one who had a 100% hit rate, and it was Jesus and Jesus alone. Why? Because, again, healing is not in the hands of the one with the gift. Healing is in the hands of God. And so he gets to decide. He gets to choose. And his will is perfect. He is sovereign, so he is powerful to do it, but he is also sovereign and good, so he can do it at its best. If we have the gift, we pray. We pray with great faith, but we know it's not always going to be like that. Whether you get healed in that moment as that person who has the gift prays for you or someone else prays for you, we also know that it will be healed in eternity. Second thing that I think is an error that we sometimes fall into is that we, we walk out untested testimonies. And I think this is something that's so important because this is an area where we have seen this abused and misused in so many ways. This person got paid to lie and tell a testimony. Or there's a testimony that we're not quite sure what's here. I think it's so important that our process is always let's, let's, let's be a, a people that testify at the goodness of God. The church should do that. The people of God should share in those testimonies because they're signposts that point us to the glory of God. But I don't think we should end it there. If there's been a testimony, hey, here's a healing Let's get that checked because all it's going to do is give us the verifiedness that we can then stand on the truth that this is a real thing. I'll tell you a story. Uh, I can tell you right now, I don't, I don't believe I have the gift of healing. Say that for free. But there have been two occasions where I have prayed for people and they have been healed. Both times it was knees. I don't know why. Maybe God's got a thing with me and knees. Um, and I'll say this. It's personal. <laughs> It might not be this, I'm just sharing my story with you. It might not look like this every time. It's so important that we understand. I, I was speaking to a lady in, after the 8 a.m. Jesus changed. Whenever he did a healing, he did it a million different ways because I think he knew we would come up with a formula that says A plus B equals C. So we don't do that. But for some reason, two times I prayed for it needs to be healed and they have. The first time was when I was a youth pastor. I had a, a, a kid in high school. He walked in. His knee had got blown out in a rugby game. He was scheduled the next week for uh, a complete re repair of his ACL. And uh, it was it. He was, he was down. And so we had a moment. We were praying for him. I just felt I needed to pray for actual healing in his leg. And so I prayed over his knee. The other guy was a guy who was in a men's group with. And he also came in on crutches. And uh, it wasn't quite as bad. He was in, on week two of an eight-week program with a physio because they needed to do some work. Uh, he had hurt his knee playing five-a-side. Guys, if you've got the dad bod like me, give the, give the five-a-side up. I've seen too many knees blown out. It's not helpful. Don't do it. Sometimes we need wisdom before we pray for healing. <laughs> but I, I, I prayed for this guy, and both times I had prayed... They got a warm sensation, like heat in their knee. Don't know why. Again, please don't take the formula. That's what happened. And they felt a sense of peace at the end of it. And they got up and gave it a try. Both of them, for the rest of the night, didn't use their crutches. Now, you could leave it there and be like, oh, testimony, look how amazing. I think we need a step further. And so when the high school um, guy's dad came and picked him up, I made sure I met with the dad and I said, hey, listen, this is what happened. We prayed for it. I'm not going to lie to you. It might be adrenaline. It might be, but I know he's going for his checkup before the surgery, will you, just so you know, will you, will you maybe get that checked out. They did a full scan, did it a whole again. He didn't need the surgery. Doctor's going, I don't understand. Cool, that's where it is. Other guy got to his physio, same thing, please. Ask them, let them know, like, let's check this out. Did a sonar scan on his knee. Bro, you got some exercises, but you don't need to come back to me. There's six weeks, we, we don't need more, like it's done, it's good. 
I think we need to not be afraid. If we have faith that God can heal, we also need to have faith that God can verify what he has done. And this is why, again, God and medicine is not at odds. We, these two things come together. That actually sets up the next one beautifully. There are those who say, well, God is our healer, so we don't need medicine or doctors. You read the book of Acts, and you're so excited by the supernatural healings, forgetting that a doctor wrote it, and your conclusion is, well, God is our healer, we don't need medicine and doctors. I just want to help us here. That's not smart. God gives us all of these things. He gives us supernatural gifts, and he gives us the gifts of medicine and doctors. Both should be in the equation. That doesn't mean we walk forward in like a lack of faith. No, no, no. We walk forward with great faith, but we don't walk forward with dumb faith. And so how it plays out for us here at City is that we are the church that are going to pray for you and expect and hope that the God of the supernatural will supernaturally heal, and please go to the doctor too. One of the functions uh, of an elder that James tells us in James chapter 5 is, is any, among, is any among you sick, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. We do this where we'll pray for people. It's always available after our gatherings where we pray for those who are sick. And so we've had people do this because it's a function of an elder. First thing I want to say is, please don't think every elder has the gift of healing and yet it's still part of our function. But also, please don't limit yourself, ring fence it, and say, well, not only elders should be doing this. Because two verses later, it says this, verse 16. And again, please note, it's not just talking physical healing, complete healing. That's why it says, therefore confess your sins with each other. Sins is not just a physical issue, it's a spiritual issue. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And so actually, we're called to pray and be wise. That means if you're an elder, non-elder. That means if you have the gift of healing or not have the gift of healing, the responsibility on us is that we would pray. But our answer should never be pray only. It should actually be pray and go to the doctor. Healing's in God's hands. It's not in ours, it's not in the gift, it's not there, but we know that God has given us all of this to walk it out wisely. I ask for permission to share this before anyone freaks out. This is a big part of um, Nikita's story, my wife. Amazingly, God has used medicine and doctors in a way that you can't imagine in restoring my wife. And so a couple of, a few years ago, um, she got diagnosed with TLE, it's temporal lobe epilepsy, specifically in her right temporal lobe. And so that was playing out both physically in horrendous headaches, emotionally, it would just knock her for six. And so these episodes, and it's not like the epilepsy where everything is shaking, it's not that. It's all, and, and the episodes played out and no one knew what it was and she had suffered with it since she was young. And you can get in that moment and say, okay, cool, let's pray. God, would you supernaturally heal this? Would this be a miraculous healing? And can I tell you, we prayed for that, hoped for that, we want that. But amazingly, that's not how it played out. What actually played out was God moved pieces along, put it all together, because he has the big picture of it all, that she was sitting in the office of a psychologist who is a Christian, who also has the gift of prophecy, who in that moment she had an episode right in front of him, got to witness it, and then said, I think I know what's happening here. I need you to go to a neurologist. I need to actually, we need to get some scans going here because I think this is what it is, but let's check. Again, doctors and medicine are good things. And in that, she got diagnosed and got the right diagnosis and then was able to get medicine that has literally changed her life. And we look at that and say, oh, well, it would be so much better if God just supernaturally, miraculously healed. Can I tell you? It would be amazing. But it doesn't take away from the fact that God moved, he saw her in it, and he had a plan. And amazingly, we have the hope that ultimately in eternity, it all gets healed anyway. Last one, as a band joins me on stage. One of the dangerous beliefs that creep into church, and specifically this space, is, well, you've got great faith, and you've got the spirit in you, so therefore you can't be sick. So that means if you are sick, there's a faith issue at play. Can I tell you? That's nonsense. Just want to help you with that. That, That's nonsense. And and it's really nonsense for two things. 
Faith is important to healing. It's very clear. When we see it through the Gospels, faith is there. There might be faith in the person who needs the healing. There might be faith in the one who is giving the healing. There might be faith in an adjacent person. And then sometimes there's examples where we can't see the faith. We don't know where it is because sometimes God just does it. He can do that. He's God. But we also have a litany of people in Scripture, in the New Testament, who were faithful, loved God, and were sick. Whether it's Epaphroditus or Timothy or Trophimus, these were faithful servants, loved God, and yet they suffered in sickness. Even Paul himself suffered with sickness. And we only know some of the details, but we know he suffered over the long term with sickness. This is a guy who prayed that people would be healed and they got healed. But yet he still struggled with sickness. It doesn't make sense. And so please, let's never go down that road. We come with great faith, faith because we go to the healer. This is where I want to end as, as we get up and I know it's a little late. Why don't you stand with me? I just want to turn our eyes to Jesus before we go into a moment of ministry and response. The greatest miracle worker was Jesus. The greatest healer is Jesus. But the greatest healer and the greatest miracle worker had to be broken so that we could receive the miracle of salvation in eternity. So that we could receive the miracle of healing, that we would be restored in our relationship with Jesus. Gabs, can you guys put up that 1 Peter verse for me? Peter actually quotes from Isaiah 53. It's a, it's a bumper sticker verse that I think all of you would know that by his wounds we are healed. But the bumper sticker seems to think that it's only about the physical. Can I tell you, God's about far more than just that. That actually it points back to the truth that Jesus bore our sin on the cross and that by his wounds we are healed. It makes it very clear that that's the point, that his healing is complete restoration. Does that mean we don't pray for physically? No, we do. But understand that Jesus' heart for us is got eternity in mind because he cares for your mind, body, and soul. And for those who desire this gift, let's remember that. Let's not get, this, get despondent in it. I'm going to call Vaughn up to join me, actually. We're going to go into a time of response and ministry, and he's going to lead it. And this is a moment where all of us are on board, so please don't discount yourself. If you're not an elder, you're not, we're all going to pray. But let's hand it over to Vaughn. He's going to lead us to respond.